Hey folks, I'm Grimwit from NatchEvil.com and this is Natchian News. The current Let's Play is Stronghold Quest. Yep, we're going back into Minecraft and I couldn't be, well, not happy. Relieved, really. Since Audio Surf 2 has come out and Terraria is updated, I really haven't thought that much about Minecraft. I think most of my viewers have figured out I've become a little burned out with the game. There are also so many other games I want to do Let's Plays of, the least of which is finishing Lone Survivor. I may cheat a little on my mop-up plan and sneak in something short. I haven't decided. Meanwhile, a lot more time than usual was put into this episode of Whirlsend. I'm not sure if it's made it better or worse, but then I don't get to decide if it's good. That's your job. I only get to try. Our guest voice today is the If of Dreams, or as the rest of us call him, Z. Why don't we dig in and listen to this week's episode of World Sin Gate. World Sin Gate. Episode 9. Mnemosyne. By Mike Rojas. Special guest voice, The If of Dreams, along with Evil Seedlet. August, 1921. Red Mark Circle. Jebediah Termite, a cow-skull-faced man in a red smoking jacket, shut the front door from the inside of his cluttered yet luxurious house. He turned from the entryway deep in thought, examining the rifle he had just been handed. To all eyes it seemed a common Model 73 Winchester lever-action repeater, but it must have been something important for it to land in his hands. Jebediah's hands were very important hands. He re-entered his study where, at a small breakfast nook in front of one of the windows, sat his good friend Bloodhead. Jebediah and Bloodhead shared many oddities that helped them get along over the years. For example, Jebediah was known to never take off his cow-skull helm, making it appear as if his neck was indeed crowned with the skull of a cow. Bloodhead wore a burlap sack at all times, with a scary face poorly painted onto it. At the base of the sack, on the rope around his neck, Bloodhead had a little blood leaking out, giving his mask some well-needed color. This was how he got his name. They also both enjoyed talking about motor vehicles and royal politics. Who is that, if you don't mind me asking? inquired Bloodhead, as he worked out the logistics of drinking his morning coffee. Mr. Davis, from the Wordless Hotel. Jeb leaned the rifle next to his chair and sat at the nook. Its history feels powerful, but I couldn't guess its purpose. The old wizard shrugged. Now, you were saying... Oh, I was speaking of how I rigged a new set of four-wheel brakes on the Model T. I found the system gave my vehicle better control around the corners. If Ford Motors won't do it, then I will. But just a moment, Jim. What were you planning to do with that gun? Enchanted, I suppose. I haven't had much dealings with Mr. Davis, but he seems to know what he's doing. I told him the most he could hope for was a strengthening of the item's memory, as that is my speciality. You never told me. Could that be the meaning to all of this? Bloodhead motioned towards the study. The massive shelves only held perhaps five or six books, but they were not empty. Instead, they held every kind of bottle, jar, and glass container imaginable. Each bit of glass enclosed a single thin wire, suspending a leaden weight. If one were to put their ear to the bottles, they would hear subtle vibrations. Quite so answered the skull-faced man. I find them more efficient than books or scrolls. Memories have become a little knack of mine after I left Pennsylvania. <laughs> Much like me and my cars, I gather. Bloodhead's shoulders lifted in laughter. I never really got interested until I rode the bus into town. I never knew. Oh my, we must be careful lest we spill all our little secrets out into the world. The two friends chuckled jovially and spent the next few minutes speaking of the different car models seen in Wilson Gate. The list was not extensive. After coffee and toast, they again turned their attention to the magical jars. These are 
crude devices, my friend, said Jeb, pointing to the shelves. This rifle business requires something more refined, perhaps something of a demon. Jeb smiled behind his mask. Would you like to see? Bloodhead gulped at the concept of a demonic summoning, and then tried to make light of the subject. That sounds much too glamorous to one as myself, friend. Nonsense. Come, I'll introduce you. We need just two more items. Have you ever walked into a room and felt a tactile emptiness? One of those rooms where every corner was lit, but it felt dark and devoid. The summoning room was such a place. Despite the lack of malice from his friend, Bloodhead felt uneasy about the room he was led into. It looked as if it had once been a bedroom. The walls were blue, with black paint carefully and patiently outlining symbols and texts in an unknown yet familiar language. On the floor was a large perfect circle, holding a pattern similar to Metatron's cube, and at the center was a photograph, old but not neglected. Other than these symbols and the photo, the room had only white pillars holding up its corners and an electric bulb hanging from its center. There was no furniture, or rugs, or windows, and everything was so clean in contrast to the rest of the house, Blood had observed. Jebediah placed the rifle at the edge of the circle and held firm a baseball bat which he grabbed on the way in. He broke the unsettling silence of the place. Do you still carry the shroud? Bloodhead nodded and held up the black cotton shroud. Excellent. It's nothing too insidious, I assure you. Cotton holds memories better than anything. Jeb tittered as he picked up the photo. No one knows how well sheep remember. I used to raise them, you know. He stopped in place, looking at the old black and white. What a long time ago that was. What's that picture? Bloodhead asked. Jeb handed the unblemished photo to him. It was a picture of a family, man, woman, and small daughter, standing in front of an incomplete house. Timber and tools lay piled behind the simple-looking folk, as if they had paused in the middle of construction. Interesting. Who are they? Jeb shrugged. The blazes, if I know, but they are important. Like everything in the world, Bloodhead, it holds its memories well. The fabric of all things collect the quiverings of history, be it cloth, wood, or metal. You mean to say the longer something exists, the more it recollects? So age and power go hand in hand? In most cases. But this photo doesn't look at all old to me. It's not. Power comes from importance as well. I once found a doll in the Red House that poured out happiness from all the love the child must have put into it. It couldn't have been more than ten years old. That, Jeb pointed at the old photo, was very important to someone, as was this bat. He took the picture away from his friend, faced the circle, and spoke. I shall introduce you to my demon, but do be quiet or at least respectful. Act as if in the presence of majesty. She's very proud. Bloodhead nodded while receding into a corner. When Jebediah spoke to the picture, his words seemed to stretch into shapes unrecognizable, but still known to Bloodhead. It was as if Jebediah had found the root language to every speech man could produce, the words of angels unknown and understandable. The sound translated into, Thou fillest from the winged chalice of the soul. Thy lamp, O memory, fire-winged to its goal. Leaf-like, Jeb's photo drifted to the floor. As the electrics flickered off, the paint on the floor stretched upwards, giving form to something that was once nothing. When the unseen sculptor had finished, the room's electric bulb was dark, but the room was still lit brightly by the aura of a woman in green robes. Her flesh was as black as a starless night. Her hair was copper. Her eyes were blue and wise. In her left hand, she held an ancient stone tumbler filled with wine. And in her right hand, she gripped a flashlight shining sacredly. 
Smiling or not, Bloodhead could not tell, but her voice echoed before she spoke. Jebediah Termite, you have summoned me. I have come only because you please me so, mortal, more than reading the unwritten diary of Babe Ruth. Bloodhead's jaw dropped behind his burlap sack. Huh? I should have mentioned, Jeb said, adjusting his mask. She enjoys baseball. Jebediah bowed low to the demon and presented the bat. Please excuse my friend and accept this as my coin. Your friend is excused, Jebediah Termite. The smiling teeth of the woman shone bright white behind her black lips. And this is a fine offering. Where the wine and torch went, one could not tell. The shadowy woman held the bat up high, examining its texture. A child dreams of a home run. See here the dent of a ball that was sent into where the bleachers would be. The crowd and the child's mind cheered as the loaded bases marched one by one past home base. Glory to him, for he knew then his fate. Yes, Jebediah Termite, this is a fine offering. The baseball bat disappeared behind her robes. What shall I give in return? Jebediah held up the rifle and said, It wants to remember. The inky demon grasped the gun, sending a trill of light behind its very image. Ah, I understand, she affirmed. A man and his daughter hunted wolves in the winter woods. A shot was fired that shatters the man's heart. He used a hatchet to hide the sin from his family, but it was too late. You poor fool, Matthew Cazador. What have you done? Cazador? Bloodhead asked. The demon ignored him and gave the rifle back to Jebediah. This thing remembers now. It is so unlike its kin, Jebediah Termite. Be you cautious, for the thing this rifle kills will die of a broken heart. Bloodhead held up his hand and said, Huh, question. As long as we're delving into the mysteries of memories. Both Jebediah and the demon slowly turned to gaze at Bloodhead in disbelief. How exactly did this come to be? I mean, how do you start a tryst with the demon? Seems a strange sort of relationship in a modern setting to me. Jebediah smacked the forehead of his skull mask. Good God, he said. Forgive him. He is ignorant of the dangers. He is excused still, Jebediah Termite. To answer you, friend of Jebediah Termite, I will say you must first be flush with selfishness. Those who have called unto me sought relief from events that have carved themselves into the organ of the brain, firebolt pathways in their histories that could harm or heal souls. What is the soul if it is not made of our path? She leaned forward to pick up the photo from the ground. Was I really so selfish? Jeb asked. Oh, yes. In a way that has compensated me in scales larger than memories. This... She gave the photo back to Jeb. ...is why I always return. Be well, you, Mr. Jebediah Termite. We will meet many times again. Before she had finished... The paint fell to the floor, splashing back into place of words and symbols. Jebediah held the picture and reviewed it as if it were a mirror. Without warning, he fell to his knees and started crying. His mask tumbled into the circle, revealing the old man that he was. Wrinkles deep brown, beard short and gray, and sunken eyes red. His friend stepped forward placing a hand on the old wizard's shoulder. Uh, What's wrong, my friend? Why do you cry? Through the sobs, the old man answered, I... I... I don't know. If you like World Sin Gate or Natchian News, hit like, share, subscribe, or whatever. There's also a link in the doodly-doo if you're kind enough to donate to the cause. Every dollar will infest my heart with megalomania and drive me to the brink of insanity. <laughs> I'll also use it to buy food. Super thanks goes to Evil Seelit for her voice work. If you like Seelit's voice, she's got a YouTube channel. 
Music for this show was unknowingly provided by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. Both Seedlitz and McLeod's links are in the description below. This episode's noun was Jebediah Termite. Leave a comment suggesting your favorite person, place, or thing from this episode, and I will include it in the next, Forming a Chain of Nouns. Have nothing but fun, YouTube. Have nothing but fun.